Chapter 17, The Digestive System. So the digestive system is a canal, it's also known as the GI tract, that extends from your mouth to your anus and reaches about 29 feet in length. That's 9 meters long. It's involved in digestion, absorption, and the metabolism of nutrients. The system includes both main and accessory organs. Your main organs are your mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestines, rectum, and the anal canal. For accessory organs, these include things like your teeth, tongue, salivary glands, your liver, gallbladder, pancreas, and appendix. Here's a picture highlighting the elements of the digestive system. You can see the main organs as well as some of the accessory organs. So let's start from the top, the mouth. The mouth is also known as the oral cavity. It is a hollow chamber with a roof, floor, and walls. The roof of the mouth is formed by the hard palate. Um, which are parts of the maxillary and palatine bones, as well as the soft palate, which, an, which is an arch-shaped muscle that separates the mouth from the pharynx. The uvula is a downward projection at the end of the soft palate, and its job is to prevent food and liquid from going up and into your nasal cavities. It also assists in speech and in swallowing by helping to keep food going in that downward direction. The floor of your mouth is formed by the tongue and its muscles. The lingual um, frenulum is the fold of the mucous membrane that helps anchor the tongue to the floor of the mouth. The tongue also has papillae, which are small elevations of mucosa on the surface of the tongue, and taste buds are found in many of these. So here you can see a picture of the tongue. You can see the frenulum right here. And the papillae are all over the surface of the tongue, these rough areas. It's your uvula hanging down in the back. So teeth. We have many types of teeth. Um, you have incisors, cuspids, bicuspids, and tricuspids. Your um, deciduous teeth are also known as your baby teeth, and a full set of these equals about 20 teeth total. These first erupt at about six, month, six months, and you should have a complete set in at about two years of age. After that, you start developing your permanent teeth. A full set of permanent teeth is 32 in most, though 28 is a normal variation. The reason for this is to take into account for your four wisdom teeth. And that's because most people have them removed, or some people even never have all of their wisdom teeth erupt in the first place, meaning that they never develop the full 32 teeth. Your first permanent teeth normally start erupting at about 6 years of age, and normally this completes between the ages of 17 and 24 years. The structure of the tooth is the crown, which is the part that we see, the neck, which is the inside of it, and then the roots, which extend down into your gums. So here's a picture of the deciduous teeth. You can see baby teeth here and adult teeth. So these front ones here that are almost like pointy or not really pointy, but um, that flat line on the top are your incisors. The more pointed ones are your canines, and then you go into your molars. And here is um, a tooth. So you can see the crown is on the top. The neck is sort of this middle inside piece here where um, it meets with your gums. And then the roots extend down. And that's where it gets its nutrients from, just like the roots of a tree. So for some disorders of the mouth and the teeth, these can be infections, cancers or congenital defects as well as some other disorders and they really can cause some serious complications um, most of the time it's mal malnutrition infections and cancers of the mouth may spread to other parts of the body as well um, causing further complications
Leukopalkia is a precancerous mouth tissue, and this often comes from the use of chewing tobacco, um, or or it can be another type of just precancerous cell. But most of the time, it is associated with some sort of tobacco. People who chew tobacco can also develop what's called a snuff dipper's pouch, um, which let me see if I have a picture. My next slide. Yes. So um, this is what can happen. Um, and this is referred to as the snuff dipper's pouch. And those are all precancerous cells. That is also a type of cancer that can develop in the mouth. Those are your squamous cell cancer. And this is a picture of dental caries, which is when you actually get the rotting of teeth. The medical word for it is dental caries or cavities, that's what we call it most of the time um, in more layman's terms. So dental caries, um, that's tooth disease resulting from the permanent um, decay uh, called a cavity most of the time. And it's an infection that can actually spread to the adjacent tissues or even to the blood. It can also result in the loss of the diseased tooth which may need to be replaced by dentures or by implants. And then gingivitis can also occur. This is a gum inflammation or infection. And most of the time, this is caused by a poor oral hygiene, but it can also be a complication of diabetes or um, malnutrition, like a vitamin deficiency, or sometimes even pregnancy can result in a gingivitis. Another disorder is thrush. Um, or oral candidiasis, and this is a yeast-like fungus. If you remember us talking about, I think it was in the mechanisms of diseases chapter about um, yeast and fungus. Um, basically, what it causes is these very patchy cheese-like looking excavate that forms as a film over your tongue and in your oral mucosa, and it's itchy, but it's not easily wiped away. So if you try to itch it or scrape it off, it'll actually bleed very, very easily. And this normally occurs in people who are immunosuppressed, such as someone with AIDS or taking immunosuppressants to prevent um, organ rejection, or by someone who has been on long-term antibiotic therapy, because that uh, those antibiotics are actually killing off some of their own bacteria that would normally protect them from this fungal invasion. And then people can also get periodontitis, which is an inflammation of the periodontal membrane. So this is often a complication of an untreated gingivitis, and this is the leading cause of tooth loss among adults. So here, this is a picture of thrush or oral candidiasis. So you can see that thick white excudate is formed all over this person's mouth. So a cleft lip or a cleft palate are also things that we sometimes see. And these can either occur together or alone. And they're caused by a failure of the mouth structures to fuse completely during embryonic development. So this is something that a baby is born with. And they're the most common um, genital defects that occur in the mouth. So here you can see... Um, a cleft lip, and a cleft palate. The good thing about these is that they are very easily repaired um, with the medicine that we have today. So salivary glands, um, you secrete about a liter of saliva every day, and that comes out of three pairs of salivary glands. Um, your parotid salivary glands are the largest of these, and th these are located in the front of the ear at the angle of the jaw. And this duct opens um, into the mouth opposite to your secondary molar, so kind of a few molars up. And the interesting thing about this particular gland is that it becomes inflamed when someone has mumps. So here you can see that this is what a salivary gland looks like. Um, if you were to look at it close up, that little red dot. And here you can see where the um, salivary glands are and where they're emptying out into the mouth. And this is, you can see when one of them becomes inflamed. So see how much more swollen that side of this um, child's face is. 
So for your other types of salivary glands, you have your submandibular um, gland, and that's the duct that opens up on either side of your, luing your lingual <laughs> um, frenulum. And you have your sublingual gland, which is a duct that opens up into the floor of the mouth. So the other interesting thing about your saliva in general is that it contains salivary amylase. And the thing with salivary amylase is that it actually starts the digestion of carbohydrates. So that by the time um, those carbohydrates actually reach your stomach, they're already partially digested. So next, if we move on from your mouth, we hit the pharynx. The pharynx is a very muscular tube. If you remember, we covered this also in the respiratory section that's lined with a mucous membrane because remember, if it's open up to the outside environment, it's covered with a mucous membrane. And the function of this is both respiratory and digestive, so it's moving both air and nutrients. Um, and it's subdivided into the three anatomical segments, if you remember correctly, from the respiratory system. And that is your nasopharynx here at the top, which food should never be involved with. There's your oropharynx here at the back of the throat, and food will pass through there. And then it goes down here to your um, laryngeal pharynx. And that's because your larynx is down here. So it's kind of just named after nearby parts. So food should pass through your oropharynx and your laryngeal pharynx and down your esophagus. So a lumen is a hollow space within a tube of the digestive tract. So there are lots of lumens in the digestive tract. Um, and the tissue layers on the walls of your digestive um, tracts are your, the, these lumens um, from the inside to out are there's a mucosal lining on the inside and then there's a layer of smooth muscle. And the reason for that layer of smooth muscle is so that peristalsis can happen. Peristalsis is this very rhythmic wave-like way that the muscles contract. And the reason for that is to help keep food moving in the correct direction. So here you can see where there's the mucosal lining here on the inside. And then there's this nice muscle layer to make sure that um, peristalsis keeps happening. So next is your esophagus. Your esophagus is very muscular because remember that peristalsis lined tube, it's about 10 inches long and it connects your pharynx with your stomach. So these muscular walls just help keep pushing food down towards the stomach and at the end of your esophagus you have sphincters. So you have one at each end and basically its purpose is just to keep um, the ingested food moving in the correct direction down because we don't want it to go back up and into your mouth. So you have an upper esophageal sphincter and a lower esophageal sphincter. So sphincters are almost like valves. They're just doors that can close so that food, there's not a backflow. So next is GERD. GERD is just the abbreviation that we use when talking about gastroesophageal reflux. This is a very, very common disorder. You will see it a lot if you do anything in the medical field. And what GERD is, is that it's the backflow of acid from the stomach um, and those stomach contents to splash back up into the esophagus, which causes the symptoms of heartburn and indigestion. Um, most of the time, they're very mild and it's treated non-surgically. It's just diet change um, and weight loss and some aphid acid blocking or some buffering drugs, but sometimes it really does become more serious and more um, intensive interventions like surgery have to be put into place. So if a lot of severe frequent episodes of GERD happen, it can actually start doing things like cause severe chest pain or trigger asthma attacks, and it can actually start causing um, a narrowing of your esophagus because of all that chronic irritation, and it can start causing esophageal bleeds because that acid has just been so damaging on the lining of your esophagus. Now, untreated serious GERD can actually result in a precancerous condition called Barrett's esophagus, which means that there's precancerous cells all throughout your esophagus. And um, sometimes what they have to do for that is actually remove parts of your esophagus in order to get rid of those precancerous cells to um, prevent it from actually developing into a metastatic cancer. 
And a common symptom for GERD or for this damage is actually a hiatal hernia. And that's because it just kind of pushes on everything and changes a little bit of how everything fits inside your abdominal cavity, which can um, cause some excess pressure and result in the splashing up of that acidic stomach content. So this is just a picture of what it is. So normally the stomach, um, the fluid in stomach, which is very, very acidic, sits down here, but sometimes it splashes back up. And this lower sphincter should stop it, but sometimes it can't. So this is what happens when you get a hiatal hernia. So a little bit of your stomach pushes up through here. So, um... It's kind of just changed the whole anatomy of your stomach, and normally you would just have some stuff here in the bottom, but now if your stomach gets really full, what's going to happen is that it's splashed up into this little pocket, which creates an increased pressure and can push it up into your esophagus, creating GERD. So, let's talk about the stomach then. The stomach is a pouch for food. It lies in the upper part of the abdominal cavity, just underneath your diaphragm. And it is the size of like a large sausage when it's empty. And it expands considerably after a meal to fit it all in. Um, the contraction of the muscle or of your stomach walls um, is what actually mixes food with gastric juices to help break it down. And the reason why it can do that is that the stomach walls are very, very muscular. When it breaks it down, it breaks it down into a fluid called chyme, which is just like this even um, mixture of stomach fluid and gastric um, acidic juices and that partially broken down food. Your stomach is lined with a mucous membrane, which contains a lot of folds or rugae, and that's just because it allows the stomach to stretch and expand better, and it increases the surface area for um, better functioning of the stomach. The stomach also contains many microscopic glands that secrete gastric juice and um, hydrochloric acid into the stomach, and that's just to help digest food there. The stomach is divided into a few sections. There's the fundus, the body, and the pylorus. The pylorus is the very bottom of the stomach, and located there is your pyloric sphincter, which is a muscle that actually closes off the bottom of the stomach to retain food to facilitate that part of the digestion before it opens up and allows food to flow down into your intestines. So here you can see the fundus is located at the top. You have the body and then your pylorus is down here with your pyloric sphincter and then your duodenum, which is the first part of your small intestine. So for some disorders of the stomach, the stomach is a site of numerous diseases and um, conditions. Um, gastric disease is often exhibited by the signs and symptoms of just gastritis, which is an inflammation, anorexia, which is loss of appetite, nausea, so an upset stomach, or emesis, which is the medical term for vomiting. So most of those are just very vague and broad GI symptoms. So you can have a pylorospasm, and that's an abnormal spasm of the pyloric sphincter. This is very common in infants, and is why they do projectile vomiting. Um, you can also have a pyloric stenosis, which is when that sphincter is actually just um, stiff and obstructive and narrow, so it just doesn't allow as much food to flow through it as it normally would. Another common issue is ulcers. Ulcers are actually open wounds that are caused by how acidic the gastric juice is in your stomach. And these can occur in both your stomach or in your intestines, normally in your um, duodenum, which is the first part of your small intestine that you reach. And they are often also caused by um, an infection of H. pylori, which is a bacteria that alters the integrity of the mucous membrane that lines your stomach and your duodenum or the use of NSAIDs. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Those are things like um, ibuprofen. And they are just very rough on the lining of your stomach and your GI tract. And they can actually cause these little raw spots and trigger ulcers to happen. Normally, the treatment if somebody has an ulcer, especially if it is um, H. pylori, is an antibiotic um, and things to um, 
reduce the level of acidity in your stomach. They cause it, they call it triple therapy because they give you three different drugs to try to tackle the problem. So another problem is stomach cancer. Stomach cancer is associated with the consumption of alcohol for the most part or heavily preserved food because some of those things can be carcinogens or the use of chewing tobacco, which is just very bad for you in general. Um, and there's no real particular way to screen for it early and the symptoms for it are very vague in general. So normally it's not found in early stages. Um, and the issue with it is that it can metastasize oftentimes before you even know that you have cancer. Sometimes stomach cancer is one that they don't actually realize it's stomach cancer. They notice you have cancer somebody else, somewhere else and then find that you have stomach cancer and that that's where it came from. Um, just because the, the signs for it are so vague and general and typical for other GI disorders. So after, you stomach, after your stomach, you hit the small intestine. The small intestine is about 7 meters, which is equivalent to 20 feet long, but it's only about 2 centimeters in diameter. So very long, but very thin. And it's divided into three separate sections. There's your duodenum, your duodenum, and your ileum. And the wall of your small intestine contains smooth muscle fibers because this um, part of your GI tract still has to maintain that peristalsis and keep everything moving forward. The lining of your small intestine is still a mucous membrane that also contains many microscopic glands, just like in your stomach, and that's so that it will secrete intestinal juice. Um, and there's a villi, which are these little microscopic finger-shaped projections from the surface of the mucosa, and they... Um, they project into the intestinal cavity, and they contain a lot of blood and lymph capillaries. So they're really these finger-shaped pro projections where, um, where blood and lymph capillaries are, and they exist really just to increase surface area, to make there be even more surface, because I know the 20 feet wasn't enough, right? So that they can absorb as much of the nutrients from what you eat as possible. So here you can see little finger-like projections, right, of your intestine. So for some disorders of your small intestine, you can have enteritis. Enteritis is just intestinal inflammation. Gastroenteritis is when it's both the stomach and the intestines that are inflamed. Or you can suffer from something called malabsorption syndrome. And this is a group of symptoms that result from a failure of your body to properly absorb um, the nutrients that you're eating. Normally you see things like anorexia, so you're not hungry anymore. And that's just because your body's not absorbing what's there. You get abdominal bloating, so your stomach gets distended. Normally you have cramps and anemia and are very fatigued. So moving on from your small intestine, we're going to cover just a couple of your accessory organs. So first, let's talk about the liver. So the liver is your largest gland in the body. That's right. It's just a really big gland for the most part. Um, and it fills up the upper right section of your abdominal cavity and even extends over onto the left side. So it's classified as an exocrine gland. gland and that's because it secretes a um, substance that is used on a tissues other than itself. So it's exocrine. Um, and what it secretes is bile, and bile has a variety of metabolic functions. So there are a few ducts that leave the liver. Um, the hepatic duct is actually the duct that's going to drain the bile from the liver. And the cystic duct is which the gland which carries bile um, from the liver to the gallbladder. And then there's the common bile duct, which forms a union between the hepatic and the cystic duct and actually drains bile from the hepatic or cystic duct and out into your small intestine, your duodenum. So your gallbladder, like we mentioned, the cystic duct takes um, the bile that you make from your liver to your gallbladder. So your gallbladder lies underneath the surface of the liver and its function is just to concentrate and store bile that's produced by the liver so that you always have more of it. So here you can see, so this is part of your intestine. 
your duodenum. This is your pancreas. Your liver will be um, over here. And you have the ducts coming off of your liver. That's your gallbladder. So this is where they are joining together. Draining down into your intestines along with what's um, draining from your pancreas. It's your pancreatic duct is this one. So what can go wrong? You can have gallstones. Gallstones are um, a calculi, calculi meaning stones, um, that are made, made up of crystallized bile pigments that have mixed with calcium. Um, they are normally very, very um, painful, and people notice them when they're eating a meal and your body's trying to secrete bile. So cholelithiasis is the condition of having gallstones. Cholecystitis is what it's called when you have an inflammation of your gallbladder, and oftentimes this accompanies simply their presence being there. And the stones can also cause further complications because they can obstruct the um, bile ducts and actually cause a buildup of bile, which results in jaundice, which is the yellow color um, that sometimes people's skin appears to turn. This is just a picture of someone with gallstones. It's a whole lot of gallstones. That is completely full of them. And that's somebody's um, gallbladder right there. So that's kind of how it would look inside. That is definitely not normal. It's probably why it's outside of their body. So for other liver problems, there is hepatitis. Hepatitis is just liver inflammation. It is characterized by a liver enlargement. Normally they become jaundiced. Um, like I said, jaundice is just that kind of yellowish appearance that people get. They normally become anorexic because they're not hungry. Their liver can't help them digest, so they just don't feel hungry. They're normally very uncomfortable. Um, they have kind of a gray to white color feces because their body isn't digesting normally and normally very dark, dark urine. And this can cause by a variety of factors, toxins in your body, bacteria, viruses, or parasites are some of the common causes. You can have cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is actually degeneration of the liver tissue, and this involves um, replacement of the normal tissue with a very fibrous and fatty tissue so that um, maybe the normal tissue was damaged before, but now it's a unfunctioning fibrous fatty tissue. And then another common complication is portal hypertension. So portal hypertension is when you have high blood pressure in the hepatic portal veins. So hopefully that rings a bell from when we covered the circulatory system. Um, and that's normally caused by an obstruction of blood flow through your liver um, because it's diseased. So this can actually result in varices of some of the surrounding systemic veins. So if you remember with um, your portal circulation, all of the blood vessels in your GI tract all drained into your um, portal circulation. So if those vessels are very stiff and they're not going to allow blood flow to happen normally, then the, the problem is that it's going to kind of back up and then create a lot of excess pressure in the vessels of the rest of my GI tract um, where the blood's supposed to be draining from and actually risk them rupturing. So a lot of, um, you can have, have kind of varicose veins throughout your GI tract because of this portal hypertension causing this backflow and a lot of pressure and hypertension in your um, vessels. Only in your GI tract, though. It's not for the rest of your body. This happens in this very specific um, circulatory cycle. So that's just a picture of someone with um, cirrhosis. So see how their liver just looks almost fatty and it's bumpy? That's because all that normal healthy tissue has been replaced by fatty damaged tissue. And here you can see this is someone who had portal circulation. See how there are all these little wide kind of aneurysm bubbles? That's what we call esophageal varices because you can see that they have them up here going into their esophagus. And those are um, under very high pressure and at very high risk for bleeding. 
So next we'll do another accessory organ, your pancreas. Your pancreas is located behind your stomach. So what does your pancreas do? Well, your pancreas functions to separate um, or to secrete, sorry, secrete pancreatic juice into the pancreatic duct. Um, and this duct, duct empties into your um, duodenum. Now, hopefully you remember the pancreas from when we were talking about diabetes and insulin and glucagon um, from your endocrine section. But for the most part, your, um, your pancreas' main job is to secrete insulin and glucagon. Insulin is what your body secretes when there's a carbohydrate content in your blood, and that's because it needs insulin to break it down and be able to use it. And a glucagon is what it secretes when it needs to go to your liver and tell your liver to start breaking down the glycogen into glucose because glycogen is the form or the stored form of um, carbohydrates in your body, but glucose is the form that we can actually use. So without a functioning pancreas, without being able to form glucagon and insulin, then you can't use the, um, the carbohydrates that you take in for food. So pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is the inflammation of your pancreas. Acute pancreatitis results from a blockage of the ducts that force the pancreatic juice, um, and they cause it to backflow. So besides just the fact that your pancreas releases insulin and glucagon, it also releases a lot of enzymes that have to do with digesting a ton of different nutrients that you take into your body. So the problem with this is that normally when it flows forward, you, your digestion works great. But if it's blocked and it backflows into your pancreas, your pancreas almost starts digesting itself. So it can um, cause a lot of damage really fast because of how super effective those enzymes are at what they do, which is digesting material. Cystic fibrosis is another complication that can happen or another disease. It's a genetic disorder, and it's a genetic, genetic disorder that creates thick secretions throughout your body. So all of the secretions in your body are very, like, thick and sticky. So it creates a lot of complications, like respiratory. It makes very thick, sticky mucus. But another thing that happens is that it creates very thick, sticky um pancreatic juice, which causes it to very easily clog and backflow. Um, and then finally, we have pancreatic cancer, which is a very, very serious, very fatal form of cancer. So let's go back to some of your main organs. So we have your large intestine. Your large intestine is about a meter and a half long, and it uh, forms the lower or the terminal portion of your GI tract. It's divided up into a few separate sections. Those sections are your cecum, your colon, which is then um, divided into more based on the direction. So you have ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid, your rectum, and your anal canal. And then finally opens up into the exterior, which is at your anus. So here's a picture. So you can see where your ileum, which is the last portion of your small intestine, dumps into your cecum, which has this appendix right here. And then it hits your ascending colon, transverse, descending, and sigmoid before finally hitting your rectum and then your anus. So disorders of the large intestine often are related to motility. So most of the absorption of food is going to happen in your small intestine. Your large intestine is um, related to the absorption or not absorption of fluid. So um, for some of the disorders, it would be diarrhea. Diarrhea results when you have an abnormality in um, how much fluid you reabsorb. So your body is not reabsorbing fluid properly, so you have diarrhea, normally frequent, loose, um, watery stools. The other problem that can happen with this is that can actually result in dehydration or convulsions, and that's because it can really alter your fluid balance status. Another complication is kind of going to the other end of the spectrum, which is constipation. Constipation results from a decrease in um, intestinal motility or the your body absorbing too much fluid because it's dehydrated. It's kind of sucking out everything that it can from that large intestine. But the problem is, is that that makes very hard packed stools. 
So you can actually become constipated because they aren't expelled from your body very easily. And then finally, diverticulitis. Diverticulitis is an inflammation of um, these abnormal outpo out pouches that are called diverticuli that can actually um, cause constipation because they become very stiff and inflamed and decrease gastric motility. You can also have colitis. Colitis is a general name for just any inflammation located in your large intestine. And then finally, you could have colorectal cancer, which is a very common malignancy of the colon and um, of the rectum, which is associated with chronic polyps or advanced age. Also, your diet, a low-fiber, high-fat diet, um, is known to cause colorectal cancer, or you can also be genetically predisposed for it. So appendix, your appendix is a blind tube, which is located uh, directly to the cecum. And as far as we know, really, we really cannot find any digestive function that it serves. So uh, it's unknown if it's just there from evolution, and at one point it served a function, or if perhaps we just don't know what it does yet. Appendicitis is what happens when you have an inflammation or an infection of the appendix. And the problem with this is that it, your appendix is actually at a very high risk for rupture. And the reason why this is really a big problem is that because the substances or the contents of your GI tract can then leak out into your abdominal cavity. And the substances in your GI tract are not sterile, where the the inside of that GI cavity um, or your abdominal cavity is sterile. So you're basically introducing unsterile things into a sterile environment, which puts you at very high risk for infection of that entire cavity. So that's why oftentimes if you have appendicitis, they will take you to surgery if they think that it's really big and can potentially rupture. And if your appendix ruptures, like we said, it releases that infectious material, which can cause an infection of the cavity or it can actually cause infection of other nearby um, organs. So this is the most acute abdominal condition that requires surgery. And normally it affects people who are younger, um, older children to um, young adults, normally people who are less than 30 years of age. So then we'll cover your peritoneum. So your peritoneum is the membrane that lines your abdominal cavity. It's made up of a large sheet of serous membrane. And remember that the um, visceral layer is the one that covers organs and the um, parietal layer is the one that covers um, the lining of the cavity. So the visceral layer covers your organs and then there's a peritoneal space, which is the space between the parietal and the visceral layers. So um, extensions of the, pan of the peritoneum, these are the, the largest of these are your mesentery and your greater omentum. And these do serve a very important function. Your mesentery actually is an extension of the parietal peritoneum, which attaches to most of um, your small intestine, and it holds it against your abdominal wall, the posterior abdominal wall. So it kind of holds it all in place so that it doesn't get dislodged and it doesn't fold back on itself and kink off and create a lot of um, much more com or severe complications. And then your greater omentum, which is also called your lace apron, hangs down um, in the front from the lower edge of the stomach down to your colon and holds those things in place. So here you can see where um, uh, these are holding them in place. So you have your, let's see, this is your peritoneum is on the outside. And then it's being held against the back and against the front. And that's just, so this is your mesentery here. Um, and your greater omentum is in the front, just to hold everything in place to keep all of your GI organs in the right spots in your stomach. So some complications of your peritoneum. You can have peritonitis, which is an inflammation of the peritoneum resulting from an infection um, or some other kind of irritant. And this is often a common complication of that ruptured appendix. Because remember how I said if it ruptures, you're introducing bacteria and non-sterile elements into a sterile contained environment. Well, that can cause an infection of your entire cavity, which is called peritonitis. Another complication would be ascites. Ascites is an abnormal accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal space that often causes um, 
bloating or a very swollen abdomen. Someone with ascites, these are the like little old men you see that look like they're nine months pregnant. That's just fluid buildup in that space that causes that great big round, very firm belly. So you can see, I was just talking about um, where the peritoneum was before. And that is someone with ascites. See how big and round that belly is? And then here you can see where there's just a whole lot of extra space. And that's because that's where all the fluid's building up. So for digestion, so remember how in the beginning we talked about the whole purposes of what the GI system did. Digestion is the most important or one of the those three things that it talked about um, and probably one of the more important ones because these are our only digestive organs. So for a definition, the process is basically one that transforms food into a form that our body cells can absorb and actually use. So there are two different kinds of digestion. There's mechanical digestion, which is the actual act of chewing and swallowing. Um, and the peristalsis, the movement, which actually helps to break down food by mixing it with that digestive, with those digestive juices that we have in our body. And then there's chemical digestion, which breaks up um, larger molecules into um, compounds and smaller compounds and breaks them down into these little small molecules that our bodies can actually use and absorb. So the enzymes in chemical digestion. Enzymes are protein molecules that act as catalysts. Catalysts um, are just things that speed up a reaction. So chemical digestion involves specific enzymes that speed up the breaking down of these specific molecules into a form that our body can use. And hydrolysis is an enzyme that speeds up a reaction by adding water to break up a larger molecule into smaller molecules. So for carbohydrate digestion, this happens mainly in the small intestine. Pancreatic amylase is a very important one here, and that's because it changes starches into maltose, which is what our bodies um, can then change into glucose. So glucose, like I said before, when we've been talking about insulin and the pancreas, glucose is the form of car carbohydrates that our bodies use for energy. So our body's goal is to turn pretty much every carbohydrate that we get to simplify it down to make glucose. And pancreatic amylase is one of the things that's used for that, as well as um, intestinal juice enzymes. So your small intestine and your pancreatic amylase are what breaks down carbohydrates. And then for protein digestion, this actually starts in the stomach and is then completed in your small intestine. And the gastric juices um, contain the enzymes renin and pepsid. Um, and these help to partially digest proteins. And then your pancreatic enzymes um, and trypsin complete the digestion into amino acids. Amino acids are what proteins make when they're completely broken down. So then... Um, the intestinal enzymes and um, help help to further complete it. Um, or they, they can help to further complete um, even more of those partially digested ones. Um, because we want to digest all of our proteins into amino acids because amino acids are the building blocks and they're, they're things that are going to help our body form almost all of our tissue. So that's the intestinal enzymes and your um, peptid diases. And then we'll do fat digestion. So bile... Um, it doesn't really contain enzymes to help the breakdown of fat, but it emulsifies fat. So what emulsifies means is that it just breaks it down into smaller and smaller little droplets. So it's kind of breaking up the fat into little teeny pieces so that then the pancreatic lipase can actually come in and change that emulsified fat into fatty acids and glycerol in the small intestines. And those are the substances that we get from fat that our body can use. And then um, 
we have absorption. So after digestion, we need to absorb it, correct? So the definition of absorption is when um, digestive food moves from the intestine to the blood or the lymph. So it goes from just being broken down into a form that we can use to actually being absorbed into our body so that it can actually use it. So the absorption site, foods and most waters are absorbed in the small intestine and then water is also absorbed in the large intestine just like I mentioned previously. And that brings us to the end of the digestive system.